your word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 3. Now, uh, we see here, basically this entire chapter covers John the Baptist. And that's what we're going to be preaching about this morning. We'll go a little bit, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of scripture given about John the Baptist. So we're going to go into a little bit of the life of John the Baptist and just being a Baptist in general. And what it means to be a Baptist today, you know, being a Baptist ought to be that you're different from the rest of Christianity. There is, you know, Christianity as a whole. You have all these various denominations. You have Catholics, Protestants, you know, under this big umbrella of Christianity. And honestly, when you look at most of them, yeah, they have theological differences. They have, um, if you were to talk to them and discuss the Bible and doctrine, You'll have one group might say one thing, another group might say something a little bit different, another group might say something a little bit different, but nothing stands out about almost any of them from each other. I mean, you, there's no way you can tell practically one from another. There's a few that stand out, but very, very, very few. And we as Baptists ought to be sanctified and set apart as a people, as a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And we should be identified as people who, you know, we don't look like the world. We don't act like the world. We're not into the world's, what the world has to offer, which the vast majority of Christianity is. The vast majority of Christianity, they don't care. They, they're just like anyone who's unsaved for the most part, except when you finally talk to them, you might, you might understand a little bit what they believe. We don't, we ought not to be like that. We ought to be someone that you can look at. We ought to be people that you can look at and be like, they're different. They're not like the rest of the world. They're not even like the rest of Christianity. There's something different about them. And that's the way that we ought to live. And um, John the Baptist was one such person. And we're going to look at his life a little bit and see what we can learn from him as a good example and as what a Baptist preacher ought to be like. A preacher, yes. Definitely, uh, just any preacher, but then a Baptist preacher specifically because he was John the Baptist. That's what he was. He, he baptized people just as we do. And you, we could see in this verse, um, you know, one of the things about being a Baptist is obviously we baptize people. We baptize people after they believe on, on the Lord Jesus Christ, as Acts 8.37 states. Clearly, the, the condition for being baptized is believing on Jesus with all of your heart. But... Um, even in, in chapter 3 here, this is where Jesus gets baptized of John. And it says that he um, came out of the water right here in verse 16. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open. We, um, we believe in baptism by complete immersion. That's what the word baptism even means. It's just a transliteration from, from the Hebrew, or I mean, for, excuse me, from the Greek into English. But it just really, literally just means to be immersed. We do complete immersion underwater for baptism. Found all throughout Scripture. I'm not going to get into that too much. I want to focus a lot more on John. But let's jump back up to the beginning of this chapter in, in Matthew 3. Because we're going to look at the life of John. And, you know, one more point about the whole is Christianity in general. Because people always have a tendency today to just accept Christian history as being through the Catholic Church. People just have this notion, like, you talk to people, and especially people who don't know anything about church or religion, um, even those that do, like, they study a certain they just say, oh, the church fathers, and they're talking about, like, the Catholic Church. And they'll go back, like, a few hundred years, or, I mean, like, a few hundred years after Christ, or 500 years after Christ, or whatever, and they'll say, you know, and I've heard this in atheist and libertarian circles and stuff. And, oh, you just believe, you know, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea. They're the ones that gave you your Bible and they're the ones that is. No, they're not. No, they're not. Look, that's what some history book might tell you. That's what the public school might tell you. That's what you might find somewhere on the Internet. But look, the true religion, the true Christianity has been around Ever since Christ and, and you know, even prior to that, the, just the true religion of worshiping God, of worshiping God Almighty, Jehovah God, has been around forever. Now, 
the Pharisees, the Sadducees, it's obvious they didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in the Lord, but they were called, you know, they were under the big umbrella of Judaism. Just like today, we have this big umbrella of Christianity, but the vast majority of them aren't even right with God. They're not even saved, but they're, they're called this under this, this big umbrella. We have received God's word that has been accepted by believing churches throughout time. The, the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote, the epistles that Peter wrote, and, and all these different, you know, the, the word of God that's been relayed to us. We didn't need some council of Nicaea to determine that for you. And that is not where our belief system comes from. It doesn't come from the Catholic Church. It doesn't come from that council. It comes from the the. <clears throat> scriptural churches of believers that have continued to preserve God's word and to, and to duplicate and make copies and write it and, and send it to other churches full of people who are believers. The Catholic Church is not, has never been full of believers. It's, just, it's a false religion, just like the Pharisees. It's, it's the Pharisaical Christian religion. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And um, Baptists are different. True believers are different. People who belong to, to a believing church, it's different than all the rest of religion, all the rest of Christianity as a whole. But let's look at, at one of the things that made John different, because John stood out. John stood out in his day from everybody else that was preaching. I mean, people came out to be like, what is this guy going to say? Now, today we've got the internet, so people don't have to be like, wow, what is this person going to say and, and go out to see him when you have a bold preacher that's out just preaching in the wilderness. But they didn't have the internet. They didn't have these recordings to, to, to duplicate and pass around so that people could hear what he's saying. And what, what was happening, he was making such a big stir from the people who did hear him. Like, man, you got to hear what this guy is saying, that it says that all Jerusalem and um, where was that in verse number... Five, it says, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Jordan. This is the big stir that John was causing for all these people to come out and to see, like, what is, what is this guy preaching? Now, it says here in verse 1, it says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So he wasn't in the city. He wasn't in the main power. He was out in the wilderness. He was just, he was just out preaching, you know, probably some small town or whatever that that was outside of the main city and he's just out preaching and he says in verse 2 it doesn't saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now well a lot of people do this well we need more john the baptist preaching you know repentance and what they mean by repentance is that you have to turn from all of your sins to be saved now look is repentance important yes should we repent yes but is he saying here that you have to repent of all of your sins to be saved no, he just says, repent ye. And actually, in Acts 19, verse 4, the Apostle Paul tells us exactly what John meant when he said to repent. When John said, when he preached repentance, Acts 19, 4 tells us specifically what he was referring to. Acts 19, 4 says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people. So here he is, he's baptizing people. In the, you know, with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Yeah. That was his message of repentance, was you need to believe on Christ. Because you're not believing on Christ right now. You're believing in your false religion. You're trusting in being a son of Abraham. You're trusting in the works of the law. You need to repent. You need to believe on Christ because he's coming. He's coming after me. That was his mission. He came and started his ministry before Jesus Christ did. And he was preaching on this repentance. He said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ is coming. Verse number three. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So this is saying in the book of Isaiah, it was prophesied. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, which was John. John is fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah the prophet by preaching in the wilderness. And um, he was saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse number four, and the, same, and the same John had his raiment of camel's hair 
and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So he's, here's a man, get the, try to get this picture of someone. He's preaching out in the wilderness. His clothing is, is uh, camel's, camel's hair. It's made out of camel hair. And um, probably a camel hide or whatever is, is, is his, what he's using for clothing. He's got a leather belt. And he's eating locusts and honey. That's his food because he's out in the wilderness. And here's a man of God. Does, he, does it look like he cares about his apparel? Does it look like he's worried about, oh, I need to wear the nicest, fanciest things, or I need to, to look a certain way? Oh, man, or, or is he focused on, on money and, and saving up and, and wanting to eat the, the best meals? No. He's eating insects and honey. I've never had a locust before, but it doesn't sound appetizing. It doesn't sound like anything I want to do. I know they've got a lot of protein. But, um, you know, it, it, it kept him going. And this is the type of man he was. He was a man that, that is doing the work of God and doesn't care about the things that don't matter. The food that you eat doesn't really matter. The, the clothing that you wear doesn't really matter. These things are, are vanity. But John was out in preaching the word of God. It says in verse 5, Then went out to him, we already read that, uh, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And what I really want to emphasize, because we're going to look at a lot of the things that John the Baptist said as a preacher, and we're going to see how John the Baptist was hated of many men. And he eventually was arrested, thrown in jail, and beheaded. All because of what he preached. Yeah. So, there's two things. There's the content of what he's actually saying, right? And then there's the way he's saying it. Because Baptists today will come under fire and say, oh, well, you know, what you're saying is true. You know, I believe that. That's what you're saying, what is doctrinally lines up. But I don't like the way that you're saying it. You know, you're saying in a way that's offensive. Well, let's look at what the way that John the Baptist preached here when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came. He says, O generation of vipers. He called them snakes. Say, you're just a bunch of snakes. Who's warned you about the wrath to come? You know, how do you know about hell that's coming and God's judgment and God's wrath, you snakes? This is the way that he spoke. This is... This is what he's saying. You're a generation of vipers. Oh, you ought not to be name called. Oh, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, I don't like the way that you're preaching, John the Baptist. Well, according to Jesus Christ, Jesus said there is not risen, he said, among, um, among them that are born of women there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Jesus' stamp of approval was right on the way that John the Baptist was preaching. And we're going to see a little bit more of how he preached. This is just one example. This is one sentence, one thing that he said, calling people snakes. The, specifically the Pharisees and Sadducees, false prophets, people who teach a false religion. He called them a bunch of snakes and, um, and was rebuking them publicly. Verse number 8, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. He's saying, look, you can't trust in your lineage. You can't trust in the fact that you may have physically descended from Abraham because that means nothing. You need to repent. You need to change what you believe and trust in to be saved from thinking that just because you're a child of Abraham into putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 10. He says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. He's saying, Judgment's coming and the axe is coming and it's going to come and tear down you trees. And if you're not bringing forth good fruit, if you're an evil tree that produces evil fruit, you're going to be thrown into the fire. So you better make sure you're a good tree producing good fruit. 
because a tree is known by his fruits. And here he's, he's talking to the false prophets that were bringing forth evil fruit. And um, he was just, he's basically telling them they're going to go to hell, that they're going to be cast into fire. Verse number 11, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Look at all the references here to judgment, to wrath, to hell. These are the things that John the Baptist is preaching about. Now, we read this entire chapter. We're going to go through a few other places because there's not very many mentions of John the Baptist and this whole story of John the Baptist in general in the Bible. But the little bit that we get, we could learn a lot from. If he's preaching about judgment, he's preaching about wrath, he's pre preaching about hell, and he was like the best man to ever live at that time, then, other than Jesus Christ, of course, then we could learn something from that. Let's flip over to Matthew chapter number 14. John preached hard. I mean, we already saw that a little bit in Matthew 3. And what he had to say offended a lot of people, but he was a preacher that preached with boldness. He stood up for the Word of God, and he didn't care what people thought about him. He didn't care what people said about him, which is evident in the fact that he even was able to preach against people in power and people in authority. Look at verse number 1 of Matthew 14. The Bible reads, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. So what happened here is this Herod. Now this is the events that are happening in Matthew 14. This is after John the Baptist is already put to death. He's already been executed. Herod's hearing about Jesus Christ. John was such a powerful speaker and such a powerful man of God. Even though John did no miracle, Herod actually thought that Jesus was like the reincarnation of John the Baptist. And let that sink in because... John really was a, a really powerful man, and he had a lot of people following him. He had a lot of people that he baptized, a lot of people that were listening to him, and he caused this great stir. So to the point to the, where Herod, Herod hears about Jesus, he actually thinks it's John the Baptist. And, um, but we, see, we find out here why John the Baptist was put to death. It's because Herod had married his brother Philip's wife. At, you know, somehow, I, you know, I, I, we don't know all the details of what actually happened, but it was not lawful for him to have his brother's wife. Obviously, Philip was still alive. It's not something that happened where, like, um, you know, a man has a wife and then the, the man dies and his brother tries to raise up seed unto his brother. That's not what happened. This is something where there was, like, a divorce and, and um, Herod takes his, basically just takes his brother's wife which is wickedness and sinful. And John's not afraid to tell him that. John's not afraid to tell him to his face, hey, that's not lawful for you to take your brother's wife. That's wickedness. He said, it's not lawful for thee to have her. And we see in verse, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Luke 3.19, it's a parallel to what, um, to what this story is talking about. It says, but Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done. John the Baptist, it wasn't even just for this one thing. That one thing was a big event for Herod and for his wife, who was this, you know, playing the whore, you know, going from this one man's wife to being, to being Herod's wife. She didn't, she despised John for that. She's actually the one that, that conjured up the plot for him to be beheaded because Herod didn't even want to kill him. But, um, John the Baptist not only preached about that instance, but he reproved Herod for all the evils which he had done. He was preaching against the sin and the wickedness that Herod was doing. And he was boldly proclaiming that. And everybody knew it and everyone heard it. And it says, and we'll keep reading in Matthew 14, 
Verse number five, it says, And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. So Herod's wife's daughter dances before Herod. You know, who knows what kind of dance it was, but he liked it so much that he promises whatever you want up to the half of the kingdom, whatever it is you want, I'll do it for you. Just, I mean, I don't know what kind of dance that was. Probably an extremely wicked dance to get that man in that state to just say, well, whatever you want, I'm going to give it to you. But verse number eight says, and she being there, being before instructed of her mother, said, give me here John Baptist's head and a charger. So this wasn't even her idea. This is something that her mother, her mother was so upset and vindictive about the way that John preached that it was wrong for her to be married unto Herod, that she told her daughter, you know, we want, you know, if he's going to give you anything you want, the one thing that I, and, and look, she could have had anything. Think about the money, the riches, whatever, whatever it was that she could have asked for and gotten from Herod that he could have possibly given unto her. The one thing she wants, she's like, I want John the Baptist's head. I want that man dead because she hated him so much for what he preached. And if we're going to have John the Baptist today, you better believe that there's going to be a lot of hate coming from people that are probably going to want you dead because of what you're saying, because you're just proclaiming the truth and because you're proclaiming the wickedness of this world, which is exactly why Jesus said that they hated him. Yeah. Because he said, I testify that the works thereof are evil. He testifies of the world that the works thereof are evil. That is why Jesus was hated. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the man who was healing people and saving people and performing miracles before people's eyes was hated because he reproved the world of wickedness. Don't let the, the persecution scare you from the right kind of preaching. If it is the right kind of preaching, there ought to be persecutions. This is going to happen because the world today is no better than it was when the time that Jesus walked around on this earth. If anything, it's worse. But I mean, I don't know exactly what the, the time was like then, but I, they probably didn't have faggots you know, marching around in the streets proclaiming their pride and everyone's okay with it and just saying, this is, this is great, let's embrace it. I don't know. But how, how much worse can it get than that? Don't be, don't be scared of the, of, the, of the anger and the vitriol and the hatred that comes from those that hate God and from those that hate the Bible, as um, Herodias did. And we see in verse 9, it says, And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her, and he sent and beheaded John in the prison. So that's how John died. One of the greatest men to ever walk this earth was beheaded, was cut off. And that's a glory and an honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can look at that today and be like, oh, man, I don't want to be beheaded. And I mean, who does? It's not like you, you want to, to struggle and go through these tribulations and be put in prison and have your head cut off. But you actually can rejoice if you find yourself in that position for the cause of Christ. If you're preaching God's word and people hate you for that and you get cast into prison for that and someone's going to put you to death for that, hey, be glad because you've earned yourself a great reward in heaven if that's the case. And if you faint not and if you endure the, the persecutions without backing down and compromising, you've earned yourself a great reward. And you could be happy and count it joyful just like we... Um, in the book of Acts, while I was preaching through that, it's amazing when you see that they, they um, rejoiced and leaped for joy because they were so glad that they were able to suffer for Christ. Like they just got done getting beat, getting beat up for what they were doing, and they were happy about it. That's a great attitude to have. When you can just be joyful and not let it... And you know what? That's the attitude you're going to have to have in order to, to keep going. In order for that not to knock you out. Because what the enemy wants to do, their big thing is they want to scare you and intimidate you and just get you to shut up and to get you out of church. 
That is their ultimate goal. So they, they put up, and Satan's the biggest deceiver anyways. He puts up a big facade and a big front, and he'll make things look so bad and so horrible against you. The same way that he makes sin look so good and so attractive to suck you in, he'll put up that same front and that same facade. And that's why these pastors are getting these, these death threats and, and all these other things. And it's just bullies that are saying things, but they're not going to do anything. But what they're doing is just trying to scare you yeah. and intimidate you and to get you to think twice and be like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I should just back down because if I don't, these people are going to come and kill me. And if you do that, then you're, you're more concerned about the words of man than the words of God. If you back down because of what they say. Now, it's not necessarily going to be easy, but when that happens, hey, we need to just rejoice over it. Because if you don't, if you just get scared, and you're going to buckle. Just be glad and say, hey, <laughs> praise the Lord. I'm suffering persecution for what the Bible says. Now, if you're suffering persecution because, you know, you're a criminal, you go out and do something, you know, wrong, and you're not, like, obeying the Bible, then, you know, there's no reason to be glad for your persecution for that. But if you're, if you're being persecuted for just for standing up and just standing firm on what the Bible says, and it's, it's what it says, and that's what I'm preaching, and that's why people hate you, rejoice for that. Be glad. Don't, don't let any of the hate um, back you down or get scared by it. Look at, uh, flip back, if you would, just a few pages of Matthew 11. We're going to see a little bit more of the character of John, John the Baptist. As, as defined by Jesus, by the way, not as defined by John, as, as, as Jesus um, refers to him. Matthew 11, we're going to start reading in verse number 2. The Bible reads, Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? So John's in prison, and he must have had a, just kind of a different view in his own mind about how Scripture was going to play out and what Christ was going to do. A lot of people at that time thought that Christ was going to set up the kingdom right then because they were confusing the second coming of Christ with the first coming of Christ. And they kind of expected a little bit a different way that for Jesus to act than he was acting. So John gets a little bit doubtful and he's in prison again. I mean, he's in prison. He's going through some hard times. So now he's just probably questioning and saying, you know, wait, are you, you know, are you the right person? Even though he saw the spirit descend like a dove upon Jesus, which was his sign that Jesus was the Christ and to point everyone towards Christ. He saw that and he knew that and that was his sign. He's just kind of getting into a, a doubtful state of mind now, which can happen, especially when you're being persecuted. But he sends his, you know, he sends his disciples out to, um, to, to ask Jesus, just to get, ask him that question from John. Jesus answers them in verse 4. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So he just reminds him, saying, look, look at all these things that are being done, John. You know, it's me. You got the right guy. And um, now what I also find interesting is that Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't get upset even, you know, because John's doing, has done a great work for Christ and he's in prison for his sake and he's just going to him, you know, meekly, but asking him, he has this little bit of a doubt, which should he have had that doubt? No, but Jesus isn't just, just, you know, tearing him up for having that little bit of a doubt either. Um, and look at what Jesus says then to the multitude, to the crowd concerning John in verse number seven. It says, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? Because a lot of people went out to see him, as we mentioned earlier. Right? A lot, I mean, the people from all over the place are going out to see him. He's saying, why? Why did you go out? To, what did you go out to see? He says, a reed shaken with the wind. He said, what did you expect to find? Did you expect to find someone who's just really movable? That, oh, the wind's blowing this way, he's going to go this way. And the wind's blowing that way, he's going to go that way. And he's just going to say the things that, that the people just want to hear, just depending on which way the wind's blowing. Is, is, that, is that what you expected to see? 
He says in verse 8, But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. I like the way this is described in Luke 7. Luke 7, 25 says, But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. Obviously, what he's doing is he's taking the exact opposite of what John the Baptist was like and asking him, oh, what did you expect to see a reed? No, he's, he's a rock. He's founded. He's solid in what he believes. He's staying steadfast and sure. You know, oh, what do you expect someone who's, who's pampered and, you know, wears this, this really nice, soft clothing and um, he says he's live delicately, Right. He's eating locusts and wild honey. He's got camel's hair and a belt around his, around his waist. You know, like, he's a man. He's a rough man. And he's saying, what did you expect to see when you went out in the wilderness to hear John the Baptist preach? He says in verse uh, Matthew eleven nine, 9, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before me. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. We referenced that earlier. Verse number 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. This is what the generation at that time was saying about John the Baptist. A man that preached righteousness, that preached against the wickedness, that wasn't a reed shaking in the wind and just saying whatever's popular at the time. They said he's got a devil, which is exactly what they said about Jesus Christ. They said he's of the devil. And that was blaspheming the Holy Ghost when they did that, by the way. But they said the same thing about John the Baptist. Why do you think the world would be any different today? When the world is saying... This man isn't really of God. He's got hate. He's of the devil. Guess what? He's probably doing something right because you're keeping perfect company with John the Baptist and with Jesus Christ because that's exactly what they said to the men that preached against the wickedness of their time. He has a devil. Verse 19 says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. And basically, Jesus Christ is saying, it doesn't matter. Like, he came, he wasn't eating or drinking, and then the, you know, Jesus came, and he is eating and drinking. You can't please the world. They don't like what you have to say. It doesn't matter what you're doing. They're going to find fault in anything that you do. Eating, drinking, not eating, not drinking, you know, sitting down and eating with the sinners. Oh, yeah, look at him. He's, you know, he's eating with sinners. Not sitting down and eating with them. Oh, man, look at him. He's too good for you. know. It doesn't matter what you do. They're going to condemn you either way if you're preaching what's right. Flip over to Matthew 16. And this is the last reference we're going to go to for John the Baptist. I'm going to move on um, to Jesus. Actually, that was the last reference in Matthew 8, but Matthew 16. We're going to move on to Jesus. Look at Matthew 16, verse 13. The Bible reads, When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus just, he asked his disciples, he's saying, okay, you know, you've been out and about. What are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? You know, I'm the Son of God. I'm the Son of Man. He's saying, who do people think that I am? What are, what are they talking about? What are they saying? Because we saw already that, that um, you know, Herod thought that John the Baptist, or that Jesus was John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. 
right? He's, he's someone there that, that would have, that when he heard about Jesus, he's like, well, wait, that's John the Baptist. So he asked them, and, and here's their answers. They say, okay, well, some people think you're, you are John the Baptist. That's come back again from the dead. Some people think you're Eli Elias is Elijah, Elijah from the Old Testament, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, this is really important to not just blow past this verse because what this is saying is that the attributes, the way that Jesus presented himself, the way that he preached, the things that he said when he was on this earth, people were relating these other men of the Bible to Jesus Christ. They're thinking, well, wait, this sounds like John the Baptist. This sounds like Jeremiah. This sounds like Elijah. And when you look at what these men of God did in, as recorded in Scripture, I think, again, you could get a much fuller picture of who Jesus was because people today have this warped, perverted view of Jesus Christ that he walked around and was soft-spoken yeah. and, he, and he, he was real gentle. Yeah. And he was just so loving. <laughs> he was like a cuddly little puppy. That was Jesus. He had long hair and it was real cute. And um, no, that's not how Jesus was. Look, read about these men in the Bible. Read about John the Baptist who said, what did you expect to see? A reed shaking in the wind? Was he wearing delicate clothing? Nope. Elijah? Elijah, okay, here's some stories of, from Elijah in case you don't know. He was, he was referred to as a, he was a hairy man, for one. That was, <laughs> not that that necessarily means anything, but that, when people saw him, they're like, man, you know, Elijah, that's, he's a hairy man. He was rough around the edges. Okay, he prayed that it would not rain for three years. And God listened to his prayer. It was a righteous prayer. God listened to what he said to say. He said, nope, it's not going to rain. Do you think that was nice and pleasant for the people that time to not have any rain for the crops for three whole years? No, it was judgment being brought against him. But Elijah prayed that prayer and God hearkened unto him. Now, he also brought a child back to life. Okay, he did, he, he, he did that miracle. He, um, oh, he killed the prophets of Baal. You remember when he had that, that big, um, the offering to see who, who was the real God. And he mocked them. He mocked the prophets. And then when, when his sacrifice was accepted and everybody was able to see, yeah, the Lord is God. He's the true God. This is, you know, this settles it. He had all of the other false, wicked prophets executed and put to death and I believe the Bible actually says that like he slew them the man of God did the work Samuel did the same thing Samuel executed some um, um, wicked kings he he brought judgment down as well there are men of God in the Bible that have that have brought what you know you say like a vicious or, um, you know, what you wouldn't think, like today, the, the TV preacher is like this, oh, 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 you know, this is, um, <laughs> that was a really poor invitation, but <laughs> they're like just super uber friendly and like never say anything bad, never say anything cross, never say anything that would be construed as being mean or, or anything like that. But the men of the Bible righteously speaking too, not just like in sin, but the men of the Bible would, when they were doing some of the things of God to carry out God's acts, did things that today people would freak out over. And um, Elijah, he also, another thing that Elijah did, there were soldiers coming to arrest him and two times he called fire down out of heaven to consume him. And that's what happened. And they died. And it wasn't until the third guy came and he's like, look, man, like, please don't kill me. Like, I've been sent here and God tells him it's okay to go. But, okay, these are some of the stories about Elijah. And again, with, with all these men, there's only so much in the Bible about them. Okay? And the people at this time, what else did they have to go off of but Scripture? They weren't around during the days of Elijah and Jeremiah. They have the same thing that we have to go off of them today with their scripture, with how, what type of men they were. So when we look at 
This, what people were saying about Jesus at the time, they knew about Elijah. They knew about Jeremiah, who also was cast into prison, who also didn't have a popular message, who was also hated and called a traitor, and nobody wanted to hear him. And they're saying, don't preach that stuff here. You're bringing down the morality of everybody. Go preach that somewhere else. That's what, what people were saying to Jeremiah. And all of these different men that had these negative messages to preach... Well, negative, at least in the world's eyes. A lot of them just preach the judgment of God and the wickedness of sin. That's what they likened these men to Jesus Christ. Or Jesus Christ to these men. Because that's who they thought that Jesus was. Because they didn't know what to think. And they were saying, well, he's just like these guys. Yeah. And that's when you read about Jeremiah, when you read about Elijah, keep that in mind. That people thought that that was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And make sure you have the right view of who Jesus was. The way that Jesus preached, look if you would at Luke chapter 11. Turn to Luke chapter 11. We're going to see just a few more examples of this and we'll be done. Because we're understanding why Baptists should be different. This is the type of preaching that should be coming out of Baptist churches. About believing churches. Okay, this is the type of preaching. The type of preaching that follows John the Baptist. The type of preaching that follows Jesus Christ. The type of preaching that, that preaches the way that these men of God did. Luke 11, we're going to start reading in verse 37. The Bible reads, And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. It's talking about Jesus went and, made, and ate with his Pharisee. Verse number 38, And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And that, that's again, we, I just went over this last week with, when I preached on traditions. They had this tradition of they had to wash every time before they eat. And they, they put the commandment of men above the commandments of God. And they were hypocrites. So this Pharisee is like, oh man, I can't believe he's not washing his hands before he eats. This is what he's thinking. Verse number 39. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. So this is like the first thing that Jesus says to this guy. He goes into this guy's house. He's like, okay, I'll go about it. I'll sit down and eat with you. The very first thing, the Pharisee doesn't even say anything. He's just marveling. He's like, I can't believe he's not washing his hands. So Jesus, right off the bat, says, you know what? You Pharisees, you like to have the outside clean. He says, you clean up the outside real nice. You wash your hands real good, right? So there's not even a speck of dust on your fingers. He says, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. The first words out of Jesus Christ's mouth to this Pharisee is, you're full of wickedness. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus would never say that. <laughs> Luke eleven thirty nine 39 would say different. Let's keep reading. Verse 40, ye fools... Calls them fools. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also, but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. Now he tells them the right thing to do. Not only does he rebuke him, he tells them the right thing to do. Verse 42, but woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So he's saying, you know, yeah, you're real good about tithing. You'll tithe even the smallest little tiny thing. He says, but you've, you've completely ignored the, the things that are way more important than that. Now, is the tithing important? He didn't say, he said, these things ought ye to have done. He said, okay, when you did that, you did right. He says, but you've totally just missed the, missed the boat on, on the big things. Like, that's, that thing is so little and they emphasize it so much. He says, you've omitted the weightier things. He says, pass over judgment. He lists judgment and the love of God. So in our preaching, we ought to have both. It's not just judgment, but it's not just the love of God either. We need to preach both. Those are both weighty matters. We need to preach about the judgment of God. We need to preach about the love of God. Verse number 43, Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. These are some pretty strong words. Now, mind you, Jesus Christ is like sitting down to eat with these guys. And this is the, this is the dinner conversation he's having with them. <laughs> he's saying, you know, you're like these, these dead bones in the grave and people don't realize they're even walking over them. Inside, you know, on the outside, you don't look like you have, a, you, there's no gravestone there telling people that you have this, these dead bones inside of you. But that's all you're full of. You're full of death. You're hypocrites. I like what it says in verse 45. It says, Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us. I'll say, well, wait, Jesus, you know, if you're going to say these things, then you're reproaching me too. You're, you're, you're speaking against me. Does Jesus say, oh, you, oh you're, you know what? No, I'm not preaching against you. This is just for them. I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Is that what he said? No. Look at verse 46. He said, and he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them. And ye build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers! For ye have taken away the key of knowledge, ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. The wicked are doing the same exact thing today. They're listening. They're listening online to these sermons and they're just waiting to pounce on something so that they can throw it up there and they might accuse people of saying something that's wrong or saying something that, that they want to blow up. This is exactly what's going on today. And that's what they did with Jesus. They didn't really want to learn. They weren't really interested in the truth. They were hypocrites. They just kept asking him questions just so they could catch him in his words. Just so they could trick him up. And that's the way the devil works. And that's the way he operates. But look at these harsh words from Jesus Christ himself. He didn't back down. He wasn't afraid to preach, to rebuke someone to their face while he's sitting down eating dinner with them and tell them how wicked they were and tell them that they're, they're full of dead men's bones. I mean, has anyone ever told you, you just are dead on the inside? The inside of you is just full of death. You're rotten. You're rotten to the core. That's what he's saying. They're rotten to the core. That's what Jesus said to these people. You are rotten to the core. Did he say, but God loves you? Did he say that? Because no. that's what people today will make you think that that's all Jesus ever did to everybody. That's not what he did. It's, this is the Bible, my friends. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. It's the last place we'll turn. John chapter 6, and we're done. John the Baptist, when he preached, offended people. Now, is it on purpose to try to offend people? No, he was preaching the truth. He was preaching the word of God. He was preaching the truth of righteousness and wickedness. He was just preaching the truth about it all. Preaching the truth about Jesus Christ. Preaching the truth that, hey, don't trust that Abraham is your father. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached the truth about it all. He was hated. Jesus Christ. Did he preach just so people could be offended? No. That's not the goal. The goal is for people to repent. The goal is for people to change. When we preach on wickedness and sin, it's so that if you're doing that sin, you could change. You could do what's right by God. That's the whole point. Then you could be in good standing with God if you're saved already to, to get right with Him and to get rid of that sin. That's why we preach on it. It's not so that, oh man, I want this person to be offended, so I'm just going to nail their sin today. No. 
It's like you can, you can get right. This is the whole purpose of it. Now, do people get offended when you do that? Yeah. It's bound to happen. Some people do. And typically it's because they don't have the right inside. They don't have the right heart to just receive God's word for what it says. That's the main problem. But as far as offending people goes, look at John chapter 6, verse 61. Look at verse 61 of John 6. The Bible says, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at, this is right after he, he just was preaching about being the bread of life and, you know, whosoever eateth me at the, you know, the, the whole spiel in John chapter 6, he says, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Are you offended by this? Verse number 62, What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know what that tells me? A lot of his disciples got offended. They couldn't handle what he was preaching. They couldn't take it. They got offended at the words that he said. And they were, these were people that were following Christ. They were his disciples. They were following along with him. Now, this isn't referring to the 12 because he, he gets that in the next verse. But he had other disciples than just the 12. He, and within his ministry, people were coming and going. There were, there were people following him. He had big groups, small groups. But... At this point is a time when a lot of people got offended at what he had to say. And they left. Say, I don't know what to make of this. I can't, I can't follow this. I can't follow a man that's going to say these things or whatever, you know, whatever they were thinking. But they got offended and they left. And look what he said unto, unto his disciples. Did he say, did he get worried? Did he get scared? Did he say, Oh man, you know, if you guys leave, then everyone's going to be gone. Then what am I going to do? I'll be all by myself and, and everything that I've done will be for nothing because nobody's going to be following me then. Is that what he said? No. Then said Jesus unto the 12, verse 67, will you also go away? Saying, okay. Hey, they all just left. Do you want to go too? Are you going to go too? And I'll tell you what, that's the same attitude that we have here. Now, did Jesus want them to leave? No. No, no I don't believe so. I, Jesus wants them to learn and to grow and to continue following him. And, and he loved them and he wants them to stay. But I'll tell you what, he's going to say, oh, are you offended? Do, do you want to go too? Go ahead. And if you get offended at the words of God, that's your only choice here. Because I'm not going to change what I preach. I'm not going to change on how I stand because it might offend somebody. And if you're just going to get offended, then go ahead. Because this isn't changing and I'm not changing. This is the way it's going to be here. So your choices are to stick around and try not to get offended or you can just go. And I'll just say like Jesus said, are you going to go too? Because go ahead. Because if I'm, the, if I'm the only person here, if I'm faced with everybody leaving and just me preaching the Bible, I'm going to preach the Bible. I've already made that decision. I'm not going to back down on it. And hopefully you all have the same decision made in your heart as well. That, that you believe this and it doesn't matter. You know, people come, they go, whatever it is, but you're going to stand solid on God's word. And it doesn't matter if you're hated. It doesn't matter if there's persecution. It doesn't matter if, if you know, if you get arrested for preaching the Christ, for pre preaching Christ, for preaching the Bible. Don't let any of that move you. Would to God there be more John the Baptists, Elijahs, Jeremiahs that can, that can thunder out the word of God unashamedly in the face of adversity, in the face of persecutions and not back down and not compromise. We need a lot more of that today. And I wish that the Baptists would just make sure that they could stand out and be separate from the rest and be a peculiar people and not be just like the rest of the lamestream Christianity today that, that has made up an idol 
of their own image of who Jesus Christ is because they don't even read their Bibles yeah. to see for themselves who Jesus is and who God is. Or they only read their favorite verses every week or whatever it is. Or they just hear whatever spoon-fed to them from the pulpit instead of picking up their own Bibles and reading it for themselves. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, we love you for who you are. We love you for, for all the laws that you've made. We love you for all the blessings that you've given. We love you for that, for that amazing free gift that you've given to us, that you've, you've purchased and paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ, dear Lord, and um, that you give to us for free, that we receive through faith in your name, God. We, uh, we love you for all of it. The things that are, that are pleasant, the blessings, and also for the for the. For the for the wrath, honestly, dear Lord, and for, the, and for the law, and for your judgment, and that you're a true and a just judge. God, I pray that you would please help us all to learn more about you, to have a full, appropriate, balanced view of who you, who you are, dear God. Um, I pray that you would please just, just give us all that understanding. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.